Hey everybody, welcome back. Today I wanted to do a video here on the Savage Mark II. Uh, I've had this rifle for quite a number of years and it was a work in progress for quite a while. As parts came um, that I saw that I really liked and as they came on sale and stuff, I slowly acquired parts to build it up to the final configuration that you see now here on a video. But I actually originally purchased the Mark II uh, over three years ago. So if you've seen some of my other videos, you'll notice that it kind of looks similar to my other 22 bolt gun, which is of course the CZ457, which I have right here. Mainly in the fact that it has the exact same optic setup, so it's running the exact same scope and rims, and it's also sitting in an FDE chassis from MDT. But really that's where the similarities end. They are quite different, they have different characteristics, and when you're behind the trigger on each one, they, they are a completely different rifle. So I figured I'd do a dedicated video today on the Savage because I don't think I've actually showed this on video yet, um, but I have had it for quite some time and put many, many rounds through it. So starting off with the actual uh, specific model of Mark II, this was a Mark II FV, which is really not noteworthy in anything besides the fact that it has Savage's heavy barrel profile for their rim fires. It's what I would consider more of a medium weight, but it is um, a straight barrel profile with no tapering and no fluting. It does not have a threaded muzzle, but the crown of the barrel is recessed by probably about um, one and a half to two millimeters, which I really like to see uh, to just help protect the crown of the barrel. And it's a 20 inch barrel on the FV version of the Mark II. Besides that, it was a really plain vanilla Mark II. There was nothing super tactical or special about it really. The bolt handle and bolt knob is actually just one piece. So you can't really replace that easily. And the action is just your very standard Mark II. The, the FV Mark II here came with a two piece scope base, which I really wasn't a fan of. So you can see I have replaced it with a one piece here. I remember when I first took it out of the box, the action to actually cycle the bolt was a little bit gritty and it kind of got, um, I don't want to say it got stuck or it was binding, but it just didn't feel very smooth. After I've put thousands of rounds through it and cycled this bolt many times, it's actually broken in quite nicely and it's pretty smooth now. I never actually took the bolt out to polish up the internals or anything like that. I just let itself kind of work its way in and, and break in over time and it actually feels quite nice. It's a pretty tight action, there's not much wobble in it, which I really like, and it's smoothed out really nicely. So besides the fact that it was a little bit gritty out of the box, if you give it some time and, and just work, it, work um, the action in, it, uh, it can become quite nice over some, uh, some time. Reliability, feeding, and extraction has always been really good in the Mark II for me personally. I've never had to replace the extractors um, or the extractor spring clip. The only thing I've ever done is just make sure that the bolt face is kept nice and clean. And I'll just use a little toothbrush to make sure there's no carbon buildup on the face of the bolt. The Mark II FV also comes with Savage's Accu Trigger, which is um, their adjustable trigger for pull weight on their Mark II models. I don't know if it's technically a two-stage trigger, but it feels like a two-stage trigger because you do have the trigger safety before the actual trigger pull, which obviously makes it feel like a two-stage. It's pretty good. Um, it comes with a little tool that you can use to adjust the pull weight. You do have to take the action of the rifle out of the chassis or stock in order to adjust the pull weight. Um, unfortunately though, I actually lost that little tool probably like, you know, two years ago or something, so I haven't actually played around with the pull weight at all. Um, I measured it a few months back and it's sitting at around two pounds at 10 ounces, so under three pounds. It's not too bad. Um, a lot of people wouldn't consider it match grade, and for sure, I guess it isn't, but it's, it's really not too bad for just general plinking and target practice. Eventually, I do want to acquire um, the tool or, or rig something up so that I can play around with this pull weight a little bit more and see if I can drop it down a little bit better. But the actual trigger break is not bad. It's fairly crisp. It's, it's um, again, decent enough to get you started and shoot some matches with. I have really no complaints, especially for the price point that the Mark II comes in at. And speaking of which, when I bought this three years ago, I think it was around $350 Canadian, which I think is a fair price for what you're getting. So going on to some of the changes I made, obviously I got rid of the factory stock which was quite flimsy and the length, length of pull was really short on that thing because uh, I guess it's designed more for youth perhaps but it felt a little bit too crammed when I was behind 
the gun, so I decided to upgrade the stock and I, I purchased the MDT LSS22 chassis that you see it sitting in now. The LSS22 chassis you see here is the predecessor to the current LSS rimfire. I guess they just changed the name to encompass all rimfire calibers, um, but you can see it is a very similar design and footprint. The biggest design difference between the LSS-22 here and the current version of the LSS Rimfire is the um, move to M-Lock on the new Rimfire versions. This one here just has some cuts to lighten up the chassis and comes with an integrated swivel stud for mounting a bipod. Um, but generally the overall design is very similar. They both take AR-15 um, buffer tubes, extension tubes for your buttstock as well as the pistol grip. So going on to the buttstock of the uh, rifle build here, this is actually the most recent addition to the rifle that I put on a couple months ago. Originally I was running the, um, the rifle with a regular buffer tube, AR-15 buffer tube with a collapsible Magpul CTR stock as well as a cheek riser on that CTR stock just to give me the proper comb height for my optic setup. I found though, um, with the CTR stock, even with it locked down, there was still a little bit of play in it, which I really didn't like um, personally for my precision set setups. So I decided to purchase something that was a little bit more solid that didn't have the collapsible aspect to it, which I personally didn't need anyway. So I ended up getting this stock here from MDT. This is their skeleton carving stock, and there's three different versions. This is the cheapest one in polymer. Um, the extension tube here that goes into your castle nut uh, into the Air 15 style uh, attachment here is aluminum, but the actual buttstock portion is plastic. Uh, the length of pull is adjusted with a spacer system, and I'm running it currently at the shortest length of pull. And the cheek piece is also adjustable for comb height, and you just have to loosen two set screws on the side here, and you can adjust that up and down. One thing to note, if you're going to purchase this particular stock for a Mark II specifically, just because of how it's designed, is that you can't remove the bolt from the action of the gun without fully removing the cheek piece out of the stock. The reason for that is the bolt is just too long. The MDT carbine uh, skeleton stock here does actually have a cutout on the top of the cheek piece, which is just a little piece cut out so that it gives you a little more extra room for the bolt to travel rearward to hopefully clear the action so you have enough room to take your bolt out of your, your action. Unfortunately, with the Savage Mark II, the bolt is still so long that when you take the bolt out as far rearward as possible, even into the slot, which is cut into the, the cheek piece here, there's still about an inch and a half to two inches of the bolt in the action still. So when I go to clean the gun, or if I have to remove the bolt for any reason, I do have to remove the cheek piece, which is just a little bit of a hassle, but I just thought I'd mention that for anyone thinking of purchasing the carbon skeleton stock. I thought I'd just share that for anyone who might be interested. Going on to the grip here, again, it, this LSS22 chassis takes Air 15 compatible grips. Uh, I ended up purchasing the MDT vertical grip here at the same time I purchased this stock and I'm also running the same one on the CZ. However, just a little note on the LSS 22 chassis specifically, I'm not sure if this issue has been remedied on the LSS Brimfire because um, I've never handled one with the vertical grip here from MDT in person, but um, this, this vertical grip from MDT is adjustable in the fore and aft position by about half an inch um, because it rides on an aluminum core and has these little rails built into it, which is a really neat feature because you can adjust it obviously to the size of your hand relative to where your trigger placement is. However, I found with the LSS22 chassis, if you're running the grip forward in one of the more forward positions, the, the bottom of the grip can protrude out from the chassis uh, trigger guard here and create kind of a sharp lip that is pretty uncomfortable if you ride up higher with your, your uh, trigger hand. So it can kind of catch your third finger and without gloves on, you definitely feel it. I mean, it's not sharp enough where it's gonna cut you or anything, but it is a little bit uncomfortable. On the ACC chassis that I have running the exact same grip, this isn't an issue because the trigger guard comes down low enough where no matter what position the, the vertical grip is, fore and aft, 
it sits flush with the trigger guard, so you're never going to feel this lip. Um, I might try and round these off later on because when I when I shoot my rifles, I do tend to choke up pretty high with my my uh, trigger hand. It just feels a little bit more comfortable for me, but I found that to be just a small issue that again I thought I'd just let let you know does exist when you pair up the MDT vertical grip with the LSS22 chassis specifically. And besides that though, I do like the grip quite a bit. Obviously I have two of them and I think it's a really good grip for precision style shooting and I, I do like the adjustability aspect. I forgot to mention when I was talking about the Mark II that it did come with a five round mag. I purchased a few 10 round mags just to have some backup and they work fairly well. They're an all steel design, but they are a little bit notorious for splitting at the seams. And when that happens, there's really no fixing them. They're kind of just junk at that point and you have to purchase new ones. So I'm pretty careful not to throw these around too much and treat them a little bit nicer. They, help, they hold up pretty well. I've only ever had one Savage Mark II uh, mag split on me, um, but that was quite an old mag that I actually bought used from a friend. So um, all the ones I've bought new in the past three years have been completely fine, and they're fairly inexpensive compared to other uh, rimfire mags. For example, I think these are about $25 to $30, whereas the 457 metal mags are about 60 bucks Canadian. So it's not a huge complaint of mine. So going on to the optics setup here, I mentioned the Savage Mark II FV specifically came with a two-piece scope base, which I'm really not a fan of. With the two-piece scope bases, you always have to make sure, obviously, that the front and the rear base um, are not canted or angled in any sort of way to hold your optic nice and in line. Um, so I, I wanted a one-piece scope base pretty much from the get-go. If you're not aware, um, I believe all Savage rim fires are actually produced here in Canada, which um, would make it really easy in theory for me to find a one piece scope base for the Mark II. Uh, this being because there are Mark II models out there that come from the factory with a one piece scope base. So I called up Savage Canada, this is probably like a year and a half ago, and uh, <laughs> not, not to talk badly about Savage Canada, but maybe the guy didn't have his morning coffee or something, but he couldn't for the life of him figure out what I was asking for when I was trying to find a one-piece scope base from my Mark II. And he kept saying I had to send the gun in um, for them to do any, you know, give me any parts for it. Um, so I, maybe that's a policy they have, but I, I did, really didn't want to do that at the time. So I ended up looking for a third-party solution for a one-piece scope base. Um, after doing a little bit of research online, I found this company here called uh, EGW. They make a lot of different scope bases for many different actions. Um, so this one obviously is specific to the Savage Mark II. And I'm actually kind of glad now that I went this route uh, because at the time I was building up this rifle, I wasn't into uh, rimfire precision shooting in terms of shooting matches with and stuff. Um, I was still mostly shooting within 50, maybe sometimes 70 yards. Um, but um, as I was discovering more and more about uh, rimfire 22 matches and the distances they shoot at um, a lot of people want to buy a scope base obviously with some MOA built into it so the one piece scope bases that come on savage guns from the factory uh, I believe are all zero MOA so there's no elevation built into the base um, but this EGW base is offered in 0 and 20 MOA configurations. I think there might be a 30 MOA version, um, but for on this gun here, I purchased the 20 MOA base. And again, I'm glad I want this route because now I have some elevation built into the base, uh, which obviously saves some of my elevation in the turret of my scope. So this is the route I went with the EGW scope base. You can actually see the original factory two-piece scope base in the... Uh, packaging here, I just kept them just cuz, but there's only one slot in each one, so you you can't even play around with where you put the rings. Um, the EGW base is quite nice because it actually extends out forward from where the action ends by about probably three quarters of an inch, so you have a little bit more room there for your rings if you want to play around with the scope position a little bit more. And overall, it's um, quite a nice uh, build quality. It's a um, one-piece aluminum design, and it just uses the pre-drilled pre, uh, and tapped holes that the original scope bases use to fasten 
this one piece scope base onto the action. So it's a nice solid platform to mount your, mount your optic onto and it works quite well. Going on to the scope and rings, as I mentioned before, these are the exact same uh, rings and scope that I'm running on my CZ457. So I've talked about it before in other videos. I'm not gonna to go too in depth. The only difference is that um, since the EGW scope base is a little bit lower, I'm running medium height rings on the Mark II, whereas I'm running low, uh, low height rings on the CZ457 because the uh, Area 419 scope base on that is a lot higher. Um, the medium, the medium uh, base here, pardon me, the medium rings here give me pretty good uh, height over bore for the scope. There is probably under half an inch of room uh, between the objective bill and the barrel, so pretty optimal position. The scope rings are the Pro Series from Vortex, which I really like because they use really nice beefy Torx heads, which are basically impossible to strip. Going on to the scope, this is the Vortex Diamondback Tactical First Focal Plane in a 6 to 24 variable magnification, and the objective um, bell is 50 millimeters in diameter. Again, MRAD, I keep all my scopes in mils just to keep everything standardized in my rifle setups and just to give you kind of a nutshell of why I like the scope um, clear enough glass where anything clear isn't going to be an advantage within 400 yards I would say uh, really good turrets that track well whenever I buy a new scope even if I have multiple of them I will run a quick box test and these Diamondback Tacticals have proven to track very well so I like the fact that you can dial in with the turrets obviously and not worry that they're not tracking perfectly fine uh, and the big thing if you're shooting rimfire is the fact that the parallax adjustment goes all the way down to 10 yards, which is basically a necessity for shooting rimfire. I would say minimum you could uh, get away with is 25 yard parallax adjustment. Um, but being a center fire scope, it's not very common that they go all the way down to 10 yards. So it's kind of nice to see that here. So this scope package here in the Diamondback Tactical lends itself really well to rimfire style matches, even though it, it can be used as a center fire scope as well. And then I just topped it off with the uh, same Vortex flip-up caps that I have on the 457 um, build. These are not the Defender series, these are their cheaper ones, but I find they work really well. I like the um, soft rubber that kind of protects the ends of the, uh, the scope in case I bump it up against something. So as I mentioned before, the Savage and the CZ, uh, when you put them side by side, look a little bit similar just because of the FDE MDT chassis and the scope setups that I have on them. However, they are really different um, rifles that feel really different when you're behind them. I would say the CZ definitely is a little bit more refined right out of the box. The action never really had to be broken in the same way as the Savage. Although I would have to say over the years, this has worked in really nicely and it is quite smooth uh, to operate now. But the triggers, for instance, um, is objectively better in the CZ. It's adjustable for creep, uh, over travel, as well as pull weight and has a really nice, clean, crisp break, whereas the Savage here is only adjustable for pull weight, and the break isn't quite as clean, although it isn't bad at all. Yeah, definitely enough to get you started. Value-wise, um, the Savage is a very high-value gun. Obviously, I did put some money into it, but if you were to just run it stock, um, it is a really accurate platform. And the reason why I ended up deciding to put some more money into this rifle, into the Mark II, is because um, I saw how accurate it was in its original form and just wanted to see uh, if I could upgrade it into something a little bit better. So I actually originally bought the Mark II here for the wife, um, who doesn't really shoot that much, but I just wanted a fun planking gun, something we could hit cans and bottles out to you know, 70 yards with. But when I started shooting paper with it, I realized how accurate it was and decided to just kind of upgrade a little bit. So that's kind of why I started upgrading the Mark II in the first place was because the accuracy kind of surprised me right out of the box for such a, a budget-friendly gun. So speaking of accuracy, uh, I've never shot these guns side by side on the same day in the same condition, so it's really hard to, to compare the two. I will say the Savage is a very accurate gun in its own right, and obviously the CZ doesn't really need to prove anything as um, I've shot it on videos, and CZ obviously has a very good reputation for accuracy to begin with. Um, that said, you know, if you're on the fence about buying a Mark II or, a, you know, one of the new B-22s, don't let accuracy be the factor that holds you off from purchasing one because it is plenty accurate enough to start shooting matches with. In fact, a lot of the shooters here in Canada, anyway, do use 
the Savage guns, both the Mark II and the B-22 for the matches here. I watched a lot of videos uh, from the US on YouTube and such, and you don't really see Savages as often, but here in Canada, they're, they're very, very popular and very accurate in their own right. So it, the difference in accuracy between say a Savage and a CZ or even a Voodoo, um, in my opinion, is not gonna gain you many points at all in a match. It's definitely more about the shooter and your ability to call wind and your positional shooting and stuff like that. So don't let that hold you back. I think the Mark II and Savage rifles in general are a really good option and it's a great way to save money and maybe spend a little bit more on the optic setup or on ammo and just get up there and shoot a little bit more. So I, I like that a lot. Um, the, the Savage Mark II as well, how I have it built up um, is really quite lightweight for the fact that it's sitting in an aluminum chassis. I didn't do that on purpose, but just the way that it turned out with the fairly light Caldwell bipod, um, it has for a heavyweight barrel profile, it's kind of more like a medium weight barrel. Um, and then the stock is also quite lightweight. So compared to the CZ that I've built up here in kind of like a beefy, chunky form, it is a lot lighter, um, which I kind of like for shooting offhand. So, but if I'm running on barricades and stuff, I do prefer a little bit of a heavier rifle setup, hence the uh, CZ that I built up. But I'll end off this video um, and I'll, I'll weigh the two rifle setups on camera just uh, out of curiosity. I actually haven't done it myself, so I'm curious as to what they'll tip the scales at. If I were to just hold them and estimate, um, I would say the, the Mark II is probably like a good five pounds lighter than the CZ 457 and they're running the same scope setup so it's all down to the uh, rifle. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video so far. I'm going to weigh these guns for you and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so I have my handy dandy fish scale here. I couldn't find my uh, my other scale so I'm just going to use this thing. It might not be the most accurate thing but I think it gets it pretty close within half a pound which is good enough for our comparison right now. I will weigh the CZ457 first because it's definitely the heavier of the two builds. You can see there it is teared to zero. I'm not sure if it's showing up there. I'm gonna weigh this in pounds. And I'll probably just hook this scale onto the buttstock and we will see how much this thing weighs. Hopefully I can hold it on camera there. As still as possible. And I can't actually see the screen, so I can't see what it's doing. Okay, so it's reading 13.36 uh, pounds. Let me see if I can get that on camera for you. I don't know how well the LCD screen works. But uh, let's just do it again, just to confirm. We got 13.27 pounds. So we'll just call that 13 and a quarter pounds for the CZ457, which is, honestly is actually lighter than I was expecting. I guess I'm just weak, <laughs> but uh, that's without a mag or uh, any rounds in it, obviously. For a little bit more of a fair comparison, I'll take the magazine out of the Mark II tear the scale and there's actually a M-lock slot on the bottom of the buttstock here for MDT's bag rider if you were to purchase that. I'll just hook my fish scale into that and see what this thing comes out to. Ten and a half pounds. So definitely not um, five pounds lighter than what I was estimating but I'm gonna just go ahead and verify that number so yeah, almost exactly 10 and a half pounds there again. So 13 and a quarter pounds for the CZ and 10 and a half for the Mark II. Um, honestly, it's a lot less of a difference than I thought. When you're holding these two rifle setups in person, this, this CZ just feels so much heavier. Um, maybe it's just the fact that it looks beefier, so psychologically you think it's heavier, um, but it is still substantial. I mean, three pounds is quite a bit of weight if you're gonna be carrying the rifle around on you or shooting it offhand for long periods of time. It's um, definitely a substantial weight difference, but the Mark II here is a pretty sweet gun. I've kind of neglected it a little bit lately just because I've been putting the CZ through its paces after purchasing it over the holidays. 
but uh, over time I'll definitely ease back into the Mark II and I do plan to shoot some NRL 22 matches with uh, the Savage in the future, although I will be shooting the next few with this easy just to kind of get used to it again. But anyway, that's the video today on the Savage Mark II build that, uh, that I have. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to help you guys out. So thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.